I just filmed a video on my top 10 favorite fantasy books and that got me wanting to film another video on my not top 10 favorite fantasy books. So these are books that I really enjoyed and they deserve hype, but they didn't quite make the top 10 for me. And I know a lot of people use top 10 lists to find what some good books that they should be checking out. Instead of going review by review, you just go to a top 10 list and you get 10 suggestions. And if a lot of the ones that are on that list are ones that you like as well, there's a good chance you'll like the other ones on the list that you haven't picked up yet. So these are all books that are worthy of being on top 10 lists. And if you like any of the books I mentioned in my top 10, there's a good chance you will like these books as well. But since they weren't in the top 10, they didn't get included. So I wanted to put this video together, dedicate the books that were just outside my top 10. But if you're looking for book suggestions, these are ones that you should pick up as well. So without wasting any time, let's get started. Assassin's Apprentice and Ship of Destiny. These are both by Robin Hobb, book one of the Farseer trilogy, book three of the Live Ship Traders trilogy. So Assassin's Apprentice, I know most people will say Royal Assassin is the best book in that trilogy, but for me, Assassin's Apprentice was the one that stood out. Maybe because it was the first time I was getting exposed to Robin Hobb's writing. Maybe it's because when I was reading this book, I was literally on a beach in Hawaii and as relaxed and happy as I could be. So just any book I was going to pick up was going to get a boost just from that experience. I don't know what it is. Either way, Assassin's Apprentice. I really enjoyed meeting Fitz and watching him grow up and becoming who he is. Live Ship Traders, it took me a little bit to get into this world. I wasn't as invested in it as I was Farseer Trilogy because Farseer Trilogy is more of your prototypical European type environment. Live Ship Traders, that takes place uh, most of the time on a ship or in a shipping town. So it's not quite the same environment. And the first two books, both of them had a lot of time with characters that I just absolutely hated or were so annoyed by them. By the time you get to the third book, those characters don't get a lot of page time. and Or if they do get page time, one of them turns it around where she's not a hateable character anymore. She becomes a much more respectable person, someone that you can actually cheer for. Name of the Wind and Wise Man's Fair by Patrick Rothfuss. So these are books one and two of the King Killer Chronicles. Normally I would only pick one book per series, but in this case, I don't know which of these two books I like better. Part of me wants to say Name of the Wind, but I think I actually more enjoyed Wise Man's Fair, except for one part of the book that dragged on. And if you've read the book, you know which part I knocked the half star off for. So both of these are really good. I think when I liked it, I liked Wise Man's Fair better. But Name on the Wind didn't have that time period where I wasn't enjoying it. So it was a more sustainable high, but the highs from the Wise Man's Fair were higher than Name of the Wind. So it's still a toss up to me whether I prefer book one or book two. But either way, both terrific books. I don't know if the series is ever going to be completed, but I really liked both of these books, and I think they're worth reading, even if the third book never comes out. Theft of Swords and Age of Empire by Michael J. Sullivan. So Theft of Swords is the first book in the Ryera Revelation series, or I should say it's the first omnibus because it's technically two books in Ryera Revelations. And Age of Empire is the last book in his Legends of the First Empire series. Theft of Swords is a really simple story, yet he does manage to include some mystery and intrigue on who's the bad guy and what's the purpose and what's really going on. But even with that, it was really easy to follow. It was never confusing. And the banter in this is top notch. Royce and Hadrian. They're one of my favorite duos in all of fantasy. And then you got Age of Empire, the concluding book of Legends of the First Empire. I don't want to say Sullivan's better at this than any other author, but one of his strengths is in finishing series. He writes the whole series before he publishes the first book, which lets him go back and do edits to earlier books and just make sure everything is tied together nicely. 
So by the time you get to the end, everything just, again, it just gets tied together in a nice little bow and it all makes sense. You don't have any of these plot holes or just everything flowing perfectly to get such satisfying endings. And that was the case with Age of Empire. Deadly Assessments and Siege Tactics. So Deadly Assessment is the fifth book in the Fred the Vampire series. A lot of the earlier books, Fred is really just relying on connections he's made and friendships he's developed and people are looking out for him. He's not on his own. Deadly Assessments is really the first time you see Fred having to look out for himself. He is constantly at risk in this book and no one else can do anything about it. He has to get out of trouble on his own. Now Siege Tactics, this is the fourth book in his Spelled Swords and Stealth series. And in this series, you learn more about how the world that the main characters live in interact with the real world. So the premise of the series is someone's playing, let's say, a game like D&D, but the characters, the non-player characters in those games are real people in the fantasy world, in the Dungeons and Dragons world. And in Siege Tactics, they're more aware of the people outside that are influencing their world, and the people from the real world are more aware that their actions are actually impacting real people in the game world. And the plot for this book was my favorite in the series to date. There is so much going on and the heroes of the story are stretched so thin and doing everything they can to make sure they block all of the plans for the big bad in the world. And in the end, it was just a best way to say it is a diabolical ending. Every time I've reviewed or mentioned Siege Tactic, that's the term I've used, and I'm going to keep saying it was diabolical. Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson. This is classic early Sanderson, where you're going to get the big Sander Lanch, you're going to have likable characters, you're going to have an interesting plot, and you're going to have things happen throughout the story that you don't even realize were foreshadowing the end until you look back and you go, wow, he basically told me what was going to happen and I still didn't see it coming. One of the benefits of Warbreaker, it's not a series, at least not yet. It's just a standalone. So you're able to get a taste of what Sanderson's writing is like without being overwhelmed by thinking, I have to read everything in the Cosmere. The Legend of Black Jack by A.R. Witham. This to me is one of the ultimate slump busters and I say that because it helped me get out of a huge reading slump. This is about Jack, he's a prodigy. He's a brilliant kid who remembers everything he hears and he gets pulled into this fantastical world that has relied on magic the whole time. But the magic of that world is starting to fail and they have no concept of science. They've never needed science because they've solved everything with magic. Well, Jack is a brilliant scientist, and he has to use science to overcome the obstacles that this magical world has fallen into. The Sword of Kaigen by M.L. Wong. This is one of the most emotional books I've ever read. If there was ever a book that was going to make me cry, this would have been it. Its pacing is a little weird in that the climax happens pretty much halfway through the book. So you start off with a fairly typical fantasy world where people have elemental magic and very quickly the big battle happens. Now what separates this from every other fantasy story I've read is the whole second half is focused on the emotional impact and the turmoil and the consequences of that battle. How do people move on when their brother has died or when their friend was killed right next to them and when they don't have time to properly mourn their loss and have to get ready for the next battle. What type of anguish are these people going through? So if you want an emotional read, check out Sword of Kayan. Plus, I just want to shout out, it's one of my favorite covers that I own. The Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell. Book one, book two, and book three 
all of these are absolutely fantastic. This is a series that I really struggle with figuring out which of the three books is my favorite and which is my least favorite. It set such a high bar at the beginning and it just maintains that standard all the way through the series. It's a King Arthur retelling told from the point of view of one of Arthur's friends. It's sort of like the Farseer trilogy where you have an old man who's telling the story of his life. In Farseer trilogy, Fitz is telling his own story and through his story, he's telling the story of the world as he grew up in it. In the Warlord Chronicles, Derval is telling partially his story, but partially Arthur's story as well. He is an old man who's been asked to document the King Arthur time period. And the person asking him has heard about all of these romanticized stories about Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Like, yes, all the knights met. Some of them weren't Arthur's friend. Was there a round table? Maybe. But that was just a coincidence. <laughs> Nothing special about the round table. And then it's also hard to decide whether or not this belongs in fantasy. Because the magic in this world, you can never really tell. Was it magic? Was it not magic? And that mystery goes out throughout the whole series, making it that much more intriguing. The Black Prism by Brent Weeks. This book and this series has more twists and turns than any other series I've read. Arguably, it had too much later on in the series, but the first book, The Black Prism, perfect amount. It kept me on my toes the whole time. It has one of the coolest magic systems, and it had a protagonist, well, it had a few protagonists and a few characters, and a lot of times you can't tell, are they a protagonist or are they the antagonist? Who knows? And that really kept me intrigued. The series as a whole, the longer it's been since I've read it, the less favorably I look back at it. Still one of my favorite series, still highly recommend it. But it's not as high as what I felt when I first finished it. The Black Prism, this book specifically, the longer it's been since I've read book one, this book has risen in my rankings. I think better of it now than I even did when I first finished it. It's such a joy. The action is great. Magic system is up there as one of the best magic systems I've read. And the twist and the turns and how much you don't know and how much he keeps you guessing is second to none. And finally, we got The Empire in Black and Gold by Adrian Tchaikovsky. This is the first book in the Shadows of the App series and I absolutely loved it. It's so unique. You have some people that are really good at technology, but they don't believe magic is real. And then you have other people in this world that know magic is real, but technology does not make sense to them at all. They cannot grasp it. A lock and a key, they wouldn't know how to put the key in the lock and turn it. Even things as simple as that are too advanced for the people that only know how to use magic. So I love the constant conflict you have in here where sometimes science beats magic sometimes magic beats science and then there's a war going on and it's not just magic versus technology you got the wasp kingdom that mainly use technology but they have some magic users on their side and then you have the collegium again mainly use technology but some of the people in there are magic users as well and it's Partly, do they trust the magic users for help? Because again, the people that understand technology, they don't believe magic is real. It doesn't make sense to them. Their minds will not allow them to comprehend that magic was real. And then the people in this world are so unique compared to everything else you see in fantasy. So there's different kindon in this world that inherit traits from insects or bugs. Now the wasp kingdom, they can sting just like wasps can. And they can sting repeatedly over and over again it's not just a one and done thing they can also fly now you have fly kingdom who again they're also able to fly and they're very evasive you got praying mantis who are excellent fighters beetles who have terrific endurance spiders who like to spin their complex webs they're great fighters but more than anything they like playing politics and just, you never know what a spider's real end game is. 
They're not to be trusted. And the list just goes on and on. There's scorpions, there's bees, there's dragonflies. There's so many different kindred, which partly that's why the series has dropped for me since book one, because it got too big, too confusing, too many seemingly side questy type books. Empire in Black and Gold was just the right mix of here's this real unique world with really unique people. Here's the big conflict, but it has somewhat limited scope. Just limited enough so you can get a grasp of how big it is, but not so big that it becomes overwhelming. So those are some of my favorite books that are not in my top 10. Let me know in the comments, would you have placed any of these books in your own top 10? And until next time, bye.